Hello, welcome. I see we have people joining us today. That's fantastic. I'm Lisa from San Diego Law Library, and I will be helping out today. While we let people have a minute to get signed on, I will do a little bit of housekeeping before I turn it over to our speakers today. So this is a presentation that will earn you an hour of CLE credit. And we will be sending out the certificates for the CLE later this afternoon by email, just so you know to be expecting that by email if you're a verified attendee in Zoom. This is also an interactive presentation today, and you will be able to ask your questions of Melanie and Joanna. And so if you have questions, we ask that you use the Q&A function. You will see that icon on your screen with two speech bubbles somewhere on your screen. I think it's at the bottom of mine. Uh, should be at the bottom of yours as well. And if you use that function to ask questions, you can ask them either under your own name or you can ask them anonymously if that's what you're comfortable with. Another thing I wanted to bring up is that you will see a link to a survey, a short survey. When you leave the session today, we'd really appreciate if you could take a minute or two to take our survey. We do enjoy feedback about our programs and we use that feedback for future planning and also share it with the speakers. So I think just about everybody's here and I'm gonna go ahead and uh, turn things over to Melanie and Joanna. Thank you so much, Lisa. And thank you to the San Diego Law Library for inviting us um, and for your interest in this topic, our audience attendees today. Um, Melanie and I really, so we specialize in appeals. And so our passion um, is helping you navigate your case and avoid the common mistakes that we see um, by the time a record uh, comes to us. And we really want to help you spot those issues so that you can put your, your case and your client in the best chance of success if you find yourself on appeal later. So um, we're really delighted to be here today. Um, just a quick note, Lisa, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, our firm is um, based in, we have uh, offices in San Francisco, in LA, and newly in San Diego, about two years in San Diego. Um, I started the office down here, and then I convinced Melanie to join me uh, when she retired after decades at our local Court of Appeal. She was a research attorney for Justice Haller and also has spent time in the California Supreme Court. So she is going to be able to provide us some really top-notch insight today about California practice and procedure procedure from an insider's view. And I bring about two decades of litigation experience. I, I worked as a trial attorney for many years and have specialized in appeals for about the last 15 years. And so um, we're going to kind of bounce back and forth. We're going to give you state perspective. We're going to give you a um, federal perspective. We have 12 top tips and we encourage your questions. So we have two slides in the presentation that you should have uh, gotten about 1130 today. Those slides have our contact information. You'll see them there the next two slides. So you can see a little bit more about Melanie's background and a little bit more about my background. Lisa, if you want to go to the next two slides. There's Melanie and there I am. And you will see our email addresses and our websites. In case you want to follow up after today's program, uh, we'd be happy to uh, continue the dialogue. Melanie, anything to add before we dive into the substance? No, just welcome, everybody. I'm so glad you're here. So glad you're here. And we will we will reserve questions to the end. Um, you're going to see that we have structured the presentation in our, our top tips. As I said, we have 12 um, common mistakes we're going to walk through. And so if you want to um, maybe just clarify for us, you can say, you know, this is about summary judgment or this is about, um, you know, a writ. Um, that way, even though we're going to reserve questions until the end, we will know um, precisely which mistake you want to you want to address. OK. So with all of that out of the way, um, I think you can go to the next slide. So we're gonna dive right in. Melanie, take it away. Okay, so the first mistake is not getting a transcript for everything. And this is probably the most common mistake that courts of appeals see. Now the need to ensure a complete transcript flows from the fundamental appellate rule that a judgment or order is presumed correct. So regardless of who had the burden in the trial court, the appellant has the burden to affirmatively show error. And so if a fact or objection is not on the record, the burden cannot be met and that fact does not exist. So most trial counsel know about these rules and the need for a court reporter at trial, but then they forget or make a decision not to have a court reporter 
but during motion hearings, chambers conferences, and other related proceedings, perhaps thinking it's not important or an unnecessary expense. But the problem is, is you cannot predict what's going to be important on appeal. And if the matter is not reflected in the court's reporter's transcript, you completely forfeit your right to assert a meritorious issue. And um, let me just give you an example. Um, while I was at the Court of Appeal, I worked on an appeal a while ago after a lengthy trial with experienced trial counsel. During trial, the court held an unreported chambers conference about a witness's testimony. The matter seemed completely minor at the time. But the court ruling on this testimony turned out to be a, a critical predicate to the central issue on appeal. And the court's arguments that the, uh, the appellant's arguments in its brief that the court had ruled a certain way, that had made arguments during this uh, chambers conference, that they were completely waived because we didn't see them on the record. And so those arguments were deemed forfeited and the other party prevailed. So um, now there's ways, of course, to fix this problem um, through a settled statement, for example, but and that's rule 8.837. But this process of getting a settled statement is messy, it's expensive, and the outcome is uncertain if the court doesn't agree with what your recall of the events were. So having a reporter is expensive, but it's more expensive to lose the appeal or try to undo the problem with a settled statement or some other procedure. Um, so this slide contains some examples of when a trial uh, counsel typically fails to bring a reporter. Uh, instructional um, uh, conferences, they're often held in chambers, deposition videos, phone calls with the court, other chambers conferences. For example, um, when there's discussions on responses to jury, juror questions during deliberations, um, those often don't get onto the record. And um, what I, I'll add one more thing is um, the opening statements. I noticed um, this is very common. Uh, trial counsel will tell the reporter, the court, the reporter doesn't have to report the opening statement because of course it's not evidence. But this becomes very difficult on appeal when the, when the court of appeal is looking at the case. If it doesn't know what was presented to the jury is kind of the roadmap, particularly on prejudice issues to determine whether some error, an evidentiary error or instructional error would have affected the outcome. So I, I really urge trial counsel to not, um, not um, to, to get that uh, opening statement on, uh, on the record. Um, finally, um, make sure when you do have a reporter that the minute order reflects that the, um, that the hearing motion trial was reported and uh, the identity of that reporter. So Joanna, do you wanna talk about the practical um, uh, reporter's transcript issues? Sure, and just I just want to underline a few points of what Melanie said. Um, I have seen, particularly in these days of hearings on Microsoft Teams or um, phone or another virtual setting, um, I have seen more errors with the minute orders reflecting a reporter being present because of the complications of bringing someone through Teams. And, um, and so check those minute orders right away and fix that right away. I have had that come up um, and it can end up being um, a difficult process also to get that fixed because people have moved on from, um, from, from the hearing. Um, with respect to deposition videos and recordings, um, so audio recordings, oftentimes court reporters, even if you have done the work of bringing someone, they, they will simply stop reporting at that point. And, and I would encourage you, if you know that's gonna be evidence in your case, that you work that out ahead of time that they are going to report that because um, if you think about it, what the court then sees later, I've had, for example, to send, um, you know, audio recordings and CD-ROMs and videos to the Ninth Circuit, but the question is, are they going to have the technology? Is it going to be old and outdated? Are they going to be able to run it? Are they really going to be able to see it? Now, sometimes we all know video evidence may be really critical to actually see, but it is much better for you if you have um, if you have a transcription of what was presented in court, and then you have the actual exhibit that you can have transmitted to the, to the court as well. So make sure that you are working those things out with your reporter ahead of time to have your record preserved. Always be thinking about what it would look like to someone who doesn't know your case and needs to read it cold later. 
Um, and then our final two notes on that is that if you are in trial and you think that you might have an issue where you would want to take a writ, so something is, um, you know, uh, you know, there could be an issue that could be writable and it could be significant in your case. Um, you may want to think about ordering expedited transcripts um, as your as your matter is proceeding, because that is something that is very time sensitive. And so um, you, you want to get that in the sort of in, you know, at the ready right away. Um, Melanie, anything else on that slide before we move on? No, I think that it's covered. Just keep that in mind anytime you're, you're before a court. Yes, and, and if you need the, the backup info uh, to tell your client that the expense of having a reporter is worth it, you have heard it from us. Um, so um, you, you don't want, you want to be able to protect a good outcome and to be able to challenge one that is uh, not good for your client as well. Okay, so let's move on to mistake number two. Okay, this um, is another common problem that can have really harsh consequences. The failure to recognize an immediate appealable or writable interlocutory order. Generally, as most of you know, a one final judgment rule means that only one final judgment in the case is appealable. However, by statute, there's certain interlocutory orders that are made appealable. And if such an order is appealable, you have to file a timely appeal or forever lose the opportunity to challenge that in the appellate court. Um, and the timing rules are the same as the timing rules for filing an appeal to final judgment. So we have listed some immediately appealable orders here, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. But, I, but of course, there are a lot more of those. And because of the severe consequences to an appeal, if you're not certain if an order is appealable, do some immediate research. Um, look at Code of Civil Procedure 904.1, which contains a lot of these um, special uh, uh, orders that are appealable. And the Rudder Group Guide on Civil Appeals contains a chapter on appealable judgments and orders that is really comprehensive and really helpful. And if an appealable order question is not clear cut, you might want to file a, an appeal as a precaution. Um, and, um, and then you can also file a writ petition at the same time and notify the court in the writ petition that you filed a protective um, uh, or a uh, protective um, appeal, notice of appeal to make sure that you, you haven't lost your shot. So um, some examples of some immediately appealable orders um, and the common thread you'll notice on these is um, if you wait for uh, an appeal from the final judgment in all practical terms, you, you've kind of, you, you don't really have a right to appeal. Um, so um, orders denying or granting a preliminary injunction or granting a final injunction. But the denial of a permanent injunction is not immediately appealable and can be challenged, but it can be challenged by writ. That's because it's not an immediate thing. If they deny it, you, you can um, challenge it later. Um, uh, orders appointing a receiver, um, of course, because once you've appointed the receiver, if you don't get to appeal at that time, you would have lost it if you wait for the final judgment. Um, orders denying class certifications under the death knell doctrine, those are really important. And um, similarly, an order dismissing all of class claims, even if there is a certification. Um, it, essentially, the, the reasoning is if the order is the legal equivalent to dismissing the action as to all class members, while other individual class claims remain, the order will be immediately appealable um, by the class members because they're no longer there. And uh, similarly, there's, there are similar rules with respect to PAGA, representative PAGA claims if all of those claims are dismissed from the action. Um, orders denying arbitration um, are immediately appealable and you must appeal from those. And then an order granting or denying an anti slap motion in whole or in part. And the I, when I worked at the Court of Appeal, we saw lots of untimely anti-slap appeals. And um, the important thing, there's a lot of um, mistakes made in this area. Um, the time to appeal an anti-slap order starts to run immediately upon entry of the order. So you can't, unlike a, a, if they um, grant a summary adjudication and they dismiss some of your claims, you can always bring those up later. And the, 
appeal from the final judgment. But once you once the court dismisses certain um, claims, causes of action in, in a slap order, you can you you can never challenge that again unless you timely file an appeal. And the appeal is from the entry of the order. So the time is not extended for while the court rules on a party's request for attorney's fees or cost. That has tripped up a lot of counsel and also a motion for reconsideration does not extend your time. So two caveats to this immediately appealable anti-slap um, rule is it doesn't apply if the motion was based on provision exempting certain claims from the anti-slap statute. And that, that's becoming more and more um, prevalent and, and uh, common, these, these orders. And that's Code of Civil Procedure section 425.17. And that involves commercial speech, public interest, and consumer litigation. Also, the anti-slap immediate appeal rule does not apply to limited civil cases. Um, and in addition to these listed, these three categories here listed here, there are many special um, appealability rules for, inter for interim orders in family law. That's beyond the scope of this, but if you are a family law attorney, make sure you note that and you do the research on whether an order is appealable. Um, in addition to immediately appealable orders, the California statutes make certain um, make certain uh, make a writ of mandate the only method for appellate review. You can't ever appeal it. You have to take a writ. For example, orders denying a motion to quash service of summons. That the slide says granting, but it actually. I noticed this morning it should say denying um, service of summons for lack of personal jurisdiction, ruling on a disqualification of a judge, expungement of a lease pendants, also contempt orders. And just this week, a case came out on um, a, a denial of a jury request for failure to timely pay jury uh, the jury request fees. And um, the court said, you can, you can appeal or file a writ, but if you appeal, you have to show prejudice. And the problem is, is as reflected in this opinion, you cannot, it's very difficult to show that you, uh, the outcome would have been different between having a, a trial judge or a jury. So the, the um, bottom line of this opinion is file a writ if you're denied a jury, don't go through the whole uh, trial and then try to bring an appeal. Um, so Joanna, any comments on this slide? So um, I, the only thing I have to add from the federal perspective is that writ practice is not quite as robust on the federal side. There's, as you have heard Melanie articulate, there is a more robust both statutory and common law um, set of writs that you can pers um, pursue in California appellate courts. Um, it's, it's much more limited in federal courts. We're going to address uh, in a couple of other slides some procedures for taking an interlocutory appeal in federal court. But I, would, but I would just urge you to take the point here, which is you need to understand if there is, so an injunction, for example, in federal court, also immediately appealable, uh, a preliminary injunction, denial or grant, um, or dis dissolution of an injunction. So there are immediately appealable orders and you need to understand that um, so that you're protecting your client's right and you're not waiving the right to challenge an order later if your method of review and relief was immediate appeal. Um, so um, with that, those are our two biggest slides. That's why we spent the most time on them. And we're going to punch through now um, our, our, our remaining top tips. Um, so let's go to slide number three. Okay, so this the next mistake that we see is failing to ask the trial court for support for an immediate appeal or writ review. So um, this I just alluded to this in the last slide, but in federal courts, there is a procedure by which you can ask the trial court um, to, to support a, a request for review um, on an interlocutory basis. And, and indeed, you need to ask the, the trial court. And there's a procedure as well to ask the district court um, if it would stay the, the outcome or impact of its uh, order below while you pursue that. Um, so think, for example, I, I worked on one of these uh, not that long ago where it was a grant of, of class certification. And so you can imagine then, and there's there's then a procedure by which you can ask for permission of the Ninth Circuit to take this interlocutory appeal. But you can imagine 
a class certification order uh, has come out so that but then you don't want to have to then go through class notice or ongoing discovery or ongoing issues if that's going to be challenged on appeal and so um so in that kind of scenario if you are going to take an interlocutory appeal it was not required to take that appeal it was by permission but it's it supported the challenge to it by getting the the district court support to pursue that on an interlocutory basis and so that's another thing to think about um what the what are the procedures and steps if you do have um a permissive interlocutory appeal that you want to pursue and melanie i think you're just going to add a little bit of flavor on the state court side right I was unmuted. Um, yes, there is a procedure which is not very well known and um, it where a trial court can actually sort of certify its a uh, ruling um, for writ review. Um, it's not going to be controlling because the, the appellate court goes through a lot of other factors in addition to that, you know, that there's a difference of opinion, everything. And I'll get into that a little bit later. But um, the important thing is it does help and it and it highlights the issue for the Court of Appeals. So be aware of that statute. OK, so mistake number four and Melanie, I think you're going to take the first half of this. Yes, um, I do spend a little time on this, so I'm going too long. Let me know. OK, so um, making procedural errors in summary judgment proceedings. Summary judgment appeals are, of course, common. And although they raise primarily legal issues, there's a lot of procedural mistakes that result in waiver or forfeiture of appellate arguments. And many times those procedural errors relate to the separate statement of undisputed facts. And it's, it, this is of course a critical document on appeal. It's as the uh, courts say, the golden rule of summary judgment is that if a fact or supporting evidence is not referred to in the statement, it doesn't exist and the courts of appeal take this rule seriously. So there's lots of procedural requirements for a separate statement that can trip up counsel. And the rules are contained not only in statutes, but also in the local rules and the department chamber rules. So it's important to research each one of those to make sure before you file. And the statute provides trial courts with the discretion to grant or deny the motion if these procedural requirements have not been met. So, uh, and it would be very difficult to convince the Court of Appeal that the court abused its discretion. So pay attention to those. Um, view from my time at the Court of Appeal, many separate statements appear to be thrown together at the last minute and with little thought for substance. I think there's much more attention paid to the memorandum of points and authorities, but this can be a serious mistake when the matter is on appeal. In examining summary judgment appeals, separate statements are critical to the appellate analysis. It's a way for the Court of Appeal to get its hands on whether there are actually uh, evidentiary issues for a trial on, on any particular issue. And um, so they, be careful and pay attention when you're preparing them. Don't just throw in boilerplate language, repetitive language. Um, and although the trial courts may not have a lot of time to study these, the courts of appeal and they have research attorneys and the justices do spend time on these. So, so realize that they are important. Uh, another issue in this uh, summary judgment um, is uh, it's critical, of course, to object to the evidence supporting or opposing the summary judgment or risk forfeiture on appeal. Get those objections on the record. In, in California, rule of court 3.1352 tells you how to do that. Um, finally, the appealability in California, summary judgment grants are appealable, but only after the judgment is entered. So we get a lot of um, uh, attorneys filing an appeal before there's a final judgment, after there's an order. So that's premature and it just creates more work on everybody. So make sure there's a final judgment before you appeal. On the other hand, orders denying summary judgment or granting or denying summary adjudication are not appealable. They can only be taken by a writ and, and the writ has to be filed um, tw uh, within 20 days after service of a written order. Um, okay, um, and let me just say one more thing. In seeking um, writ relief, um, you need to focus not only on the error, but on the unique harms that would flow from the delay in appellate review. 
Um, and so it's really important to say how the unique harms to you and also focus on convincing the court of the importance of the legal issue. Make it interesting so they will want to decide the, the issue right away. That's probably the most important in a writ for on the summary judgment. Okay, Joanna, and then the, the other slides will be faster. So in federal court, um, many of the same principles apply. Really what we're talking about is be sure that you protect your record, that you make your record um, complete and digestible and, and in, a, in, a, in a, um, an understandable package so that, again, someone reading it cold later can trace through. So your objections need to be able to be traced through. Your evidence needs to be able to be traced through. Um, and for example, if you prevail on uh, summary adjudication, summary judgment, you want you want to be able to then defend that successful outcome on appeal. And so having all of the procedural, um, not just compliance so that you don't lose on a technical ground below, but that so that you can protect a good outcome or challenge uh, um, an unsuccessful outcome later in the process. And so I did want to note just in federal court, there, there are a few distinct areas where you, you may have a denial of summary judgment that is immediately appealable. One that I want to mention is qualified immunity. So that can, for example, be um, appealed by the, by the um, if, if someone who's asserting that qualified immunity loses, um, that can be immediately appealed. And so you could find yourself in, in the midst of a an interlocutory appellate situation um, in a case if you're if you're pursuing, for example, a civil rights case or something like that, where qualified immunity would come into play. Um, and so I think that's my only additional comment um, on that slide, and we can jump to slide number five. All right. So pretrial motions, and this this is this is something, and I didn't mention at the outset, but this is also something where, as a trial attorney, you may want to consult with an appellate lawyer early in your case. So we get involved in cases uh, sometimes at the very beginning, sometimes midway through, sometimes um, just for post-trial motions, and sometimes just only when the appeal is happening. But you might want to consult with um, an appellate lawyer and have them assist in, if you have really significant pretrial motions, like you are fighting over big evidentiary issues, maybe about the admission of an expert um, or something that, that could be pivotal to your case, you might consider, um, or let's say jury instructions or a special verdict form, uh, something like that that's really going to um, impact your case. You might consider consulting with appellate counsel to make sure that you have strategized and, and perfected your, your record. Um, and so in the pretrial motion context, um, I wanted to mention Rule 16. So Rule 16, essentially, it's the it's about the final pretrial conference, getting ready and 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 heading into trial, and it it essentially substitutes for and supersedes all of the pleadings. And so, if there are issues that have not been preserved um, in that pretrial conference order, if there are certain kinds of relief that you are seeking that is not mentioned or or preserved in that pretrial conference order, it is superseded and it's out. It's not going to be on the table. The pretrial conference order is going to define the scope of issues that you can proceed to trial and then issues that are later, um, you know, in considered in the record for appeal. So it's really important to understand those procedures and what happens ahead of time um, in getting ready for those. And um, be sure that all of your arguments, so when you are making, for example, motions in limine, um, as the slide says, they're better than speaking objections, but make sure you get a clear ruling from the court. We all know, and you all know as trial lawyers, that sometimes the court will want to hear more of the evidence. They'll want more context before they make a ruling. But, but please keep track of those things and make sure that you get a ruling on it, because if there's not been a ruling, um, then what, what, what can you challenge later? Right. And so if the evidence just sort of comes in, but the court didn't um, actually make a ruling on it, um, that's, that is really something you need to keep track of or have someone with you keeping track of those um, items if a court has said it's going to rule on it later. Um, and if you do lose a motion in limine, you can still object again. So if you filed a written motion in limine and, and the court rules against you, you can still continue to object and you might win. You might end up persuading the court that in light of other evidence that's come in or in the context of the case, um, that it would be more prejudicial than probative or whatever your objection is. Um, uh, maybe it's a foundation challenge, maybe it's an expert qualification challenge, whatever basis on which you're, you're filing your motion in limine. And so that would more completely preserve the issue for later appellate review. Um, but you can, it's not like a one and done. So make sure that you continue to advocate um, those issues. Um, let me see if, um, and then one, one other thing I wanted to, to note for you is that often overlooked are objections and motions to strike inadmissible evidence if it's submitted um, uh, with a summary judgment motion. And so let's say you're, 
let's say you're also at trial and something has come in and it kind of got by you, you need to then make a motion to strike that evidence. Um, or if, if there had been an in limine ruling and something came in anyway, because a witness uh, ends up testifying to something, make a motion to strike and, and make sure that you, that you preserve your record that way. Melanie, I saw you on mute. Was there anything else you wanted to add to that slide before we move on? No, I was just going to highlight that it, that it is really important to again object because th there are many records where the motion, the ruling on the court's motion uh, eliminate were were a little messy or confusing. So we've seen that a lot at the court of appeal. Okay, number six. Okay, so this one is me. Um, so. We're going to now uh, narrow in on this even more robustly, making mistakes with objections during trial. Again, underlining the point to make sure you get clear rulings on this. Can't emphasize that enough. Um, and after, after you object to testimony, um, making sure that you move to strike. But then if there's something that was really prejudicial, um, you may need to ask that the jury be admonished or for a curative instruction in some way, um, or even possibly if it's, seriously, if it's serious enough, uh, move for a mistrial. And so um, as you are preparing, you know, for if there is hotly contested evidence or something that could be really prejudicial, be ready to go with all of those procedural mechanisms, um, the tools in your toolkit. Um, and if you don't do that, if you have not made those objections, if you did not move to strike, if you did not ask for a curative instruction or move for mistrial, you are going to forfeit those issues. So it is a really important preservation um, tool. And it, it might end up, you, you might then, um, if something has come in, you, you might end up getting, you know, a, a really helpful curative instruction or in some way um, really be able to, to move your affirmative case along. Um, so again, you can risk waiver if you have not preserved those issues. And let me just look through my notes. Um, the other, the other thing in making your objections is to make sure that you raise all of the grounds um, for the for the for the motion um, it, it, at trial. So, um, for example, in federal court, it's the Daubert standard for an expert. So, if you have had um, a motion in limine about this and gotten a ruling, make sure that you are um, continuing to identify what the specific grounds are for your objection at trial. Um, for example, if it's lack of foundation or unduly prejudicial, make sure that, again, that you state those objections so it's clear, not just that you're objecting, but the ground for the objection, because, again, it can risk waiver if you have not specified that. Melanie, anything to add? No. Okay. I think you are up with slide seven. Okay, so um, forgetting to offer admitted exhibits into evidence or to make offers of proof. And of course, if it's not in evidence, the appellate court will not consider it, as we said. So make sure that you actually, you may, um, your evidence may, you may think it's admitted, but make sure it actually, you've offered it and it has been admitted and check that it was noted on, on the minute order in the transcript. Um, if the court precludes testimony or evidence, Make sure you make an offer of proof on the evidence's substance, relevance, and purpose. And this seems like pretty elementary, but I saw this time and time again that um, a failure to make an offer of proof um, made the issue um, so that it, the party would not prevail on appeal. Um, the reason is, is because you need to show prejudicial error that, that, the, that the evidence that was excluded um, uh, had an, would have had effect on the outcome. And let me give you an example. If um, you, you're arguing that the court erred in allowing you to present a, 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 an additional witness to the collision, and um, the record has to contain, and the court says no, does not let that evidence in, the, the um, record has to contain what that, uh, that witness would have testified to and why that was not already into the evidence. And um, so the appellate court can determine the extent to which this witness would have helped your case and or whether it would have been cumulative, whether it was already in the record. So don't forget that very basic rule. And again, I'm gonna underline that point because if you think about from our perspective, what we have to write, not just that there was, we have to persuade the court that there was not just an error if we're representing an appellant, but that it was prejudicial error, right? So always be thinking about what would a, the appellate lawyer write or what would I write in my brief if I had to say this affected the outcome, right? And there are different standards of prejudice depending on criminal cases, civil cases, what the error is. But, you know, if you just think more likely than not, it affected the outcome. 
how are we going to know that? How is the appellate court reviewing that going to know it? How, how will counsel argue it if there's not been an offer of proof? This is what this witness would testify to, Your Honor, um, if they were permitted to testify about this um, that's not being excluded. And, and by and large, and Melanie, tell me if you, you agree with this. In the records that I reviewed and from my years in practice as a trial attorney, uh, even when a trial court is trying to move things along, and um, if, if you say, Your Honor, I'd like to take a moment to provide an offer of proof just to protect the, the record for review later. I have never seen a trial court say, I'm not going to let you protect your record, right? And so being strategic to say, you know, and this goes back actually to one of the slides Melanie mentioned about getting um, in chambers conferences reported on the record. Again, you need to come back and say, um, your honor, I'd like to put our discussion on the record now so that it can be a part of to preserve the issues. Um, same thing here. I'd like to make an offer of proof, your honor, uh, about the following issues. And and that is really essential to make that prejudice argument later, because otherwise it's essentially a who cares. Right. Um, there may have been an error, but if it didn't impact the outcome, you're not going to win the day on appeal. Okay. Yes, and I, I agree that that um, usually trial courts will allow you to do that, even if they're pressed for time. But if they don't, and it's on the record that they didn't, then any um, any attempt to provide a um, a offer of proof will, it would have been futile, and so it can be a basis for reversal. So yeah, you have to the trial court, the court of appeal has to find a reasonable probability. That the um, that the outcome would be different if the excluded evidence had not been excluded. So keep that in mind as you're in your in the trial court. Okay. So we'll go on now to verdict forms. Mistake number eight. So you're busy and you're getting ready for trial, and especially if it's a jury trial and you're you know if it's long and complicated case or even. Um, you know, maybe you have mixed equitable claims the trial court's going to rule on, but you have a piece of it's a jury trial. I, I cannot count even on two hands the number of times where I have seen the verdict form kind of be a, something everyone is thinking about at the last minute. Um, special verdict forms have their own particular challenges. They can be very risky. Um, they, uh, unlike a general verdict form where the findings are presumed in order to support the judgment, that is not true with a special verdict form. There are all kinds of uh, risk um, issues with a special verdict form in terms of, frankly, it being confusing or ambiguous or conflicting, um, and it doesn't get the same presumptions of a general verdict form. Now, there may be really good reasons to use a special verdict form in your case. I'm not saying don't do it, but don't save it to the last minute. Uh, you have to be thinking, you should be thinking, really looking at your jury instructions um, and what your elements are proof are at the outset of your case and thinking about what your verdict form would look like. Um, so um, as the slide says here, and as I just kind of gave you a thumbnail, when you're, um, whether you use a general verdict form, that, that's the hardest to challenge on appeal or a special verdict form, which is the easiest, um, you have to think about that uh, ahead of time and it can make a big difference on appeal. Largely, the biggest difference is, um, as I said, the standard of review and what those presumptions are um, and the deference that's given to the, the actual verdict and, um, and the judgment based on that verdict. Um, so in federal court, using either type, um, a general, so what I just said is about state appellate practice, state court. Um, so in federal court, using either type of uh, either a general verdict form or if the jury returns an internally inconsistent verdict, you have to object before the jury is discharged. So the judge has an opportunity to obtain clarification. You should do that in state court as well. Um, but I wanted to make sure that I highlight the requirement in federal court. Um, so, so let's say you're, you're, you have a, a multiple causes of action and there are findings that are inconsistent with one another. You need at the time. So everyone is anxious to leave. Everyone is anxious to be done. Probably the jury is anxious. The judge is anxious. But take the time to think about what that verdict means if there are inconsistent findings on the claims, because you do not want to let that jury go and, and potentially waive your right to, to, to challenge it because you didn't identify the inconsistent verdict at the time. Melanie, anything else to add? No. Okay. Um, a general rule of thumb and, and, you know, take this for what it's worth, but um, a general rule of thumb from an appellate perspective, my years of practice, I would say um, is that use a general verdict if you think you're going to win and a special verdict otherwise. <laughs> That's my kind of insider tip. <laughs> All right. Okay. Melanie, you're next. 
Okay, so um, instructional errors, inviting instructional errors or acquiescing or failing to object to instructions. In federal court, you have to file written objections to instructions. In California, it's more nuanced. The instructions proposed by your opponent are deemed to be objected to, but in many instances, the courts of appeal will find that you have waived or forfeited your right to challenge it. Um, and uh, let me give you some examples. If the court finds that the party invited or acquiesced in the giving of a civil jury instruction, forfeiture will be found. And the, the acquiescence can even be implied. For example, if the trial court asks you if you have any uh, thoughts or you have any objections to an instruction by your opponent and you don't say anything, that silence can be construed as a waiver uh, of a, an objection to a jury instruction. Um, also, if the court finds that you obtained a tactical advantage from failing to object, the Court of Appeal could find forfeiture. Um, and remember, you never have any obligation to agree to instruction, even if pressured by the judge. Um, if you, by words or conduct, withdraw your objection in any way, or if you withdraw a proposed contrary instruction, any error will be found forfeited. So it's really important, despite the rule that uh, instructions are deemed objected to, to make an express objection on the record. Now, for instructions requested by you, um, and if the court will not give your instruction, um, to avoid forfeiture, make a clear record of error. And, and I've seen this many, um, yeah, I think we, we need an instruction. This instruction doesn't work, but this one would be better, but it's vague, it's not complete. And the Court of Appeal will find that, that you did not preserve your objections. So when you make a request for an instruction, a contrary instruction, or just a instruction, you have to request a specific and complete instruction and make sure that this proposed instruction is on the record. And if you and it's also helpful if you point out why the instruction is the specific point is not made in the other instructions and why it impacts your case. So you get a full analysis of that from the court and the court of appeal can can look at that because the, the first thing, you know, instructional errors, the courts of appeal, the first thing that comes to their mind is was there any was there any waiver? Was there did they did they preserve their right? Um, and um, another important point is on the slide is when prior court rulings limit your instruction, consider proposing only your ideal instructions. Um, to, okay, so proposing your ideal instructions as well as instructions given adverse pretrial rulings. Make clear that you're offering the latter in response to the court's ruling, or if it was an interim ruling, you should re-argue the point. So, you can, you know, and you can continue all the way through trial to argue unless the court has said this, this decision is final. But um, proffering your requested instructions, assuming you had gotten a better ruling is really helpful because those will all be in the record. And um, as I pointed out before, instruction colloquies in chambers happen a lot, and, but make sure you bring a reporter or make clear what occurred in chambers. Sometimes there'll be a shorthand thing about what happened during that conference, but it's not enough for the Court of Appeal. So it, the best thing to do is to have a reporter at that time. Joanna, do you have any? Yeah, questions? Melanie, and I just had this, not too long ago, I had a, a record I was reviewing where this came up, exactly the issue you just mentioned came up where um, the, that the record had been, it had been, they had used a special verdict form and, um, and the jury um, ended up finding, you know, uh, some causes of action and some not, and some affirmative defenses and some not. And, um, and there was something where then there, then it seemed like they skipped a question and it was inconsistent. And so they were sent back, but what ended up happening when, when the court, so after counsel did a good job and everybody went and reviewed it in chambers with the judge, but then they did not. So then they brought the jury back in and they did not have then what was discussed and who wanted what 
they didn't have that put on the record. Um, then after it, or before the court ended up re-instructing the jury. And then there was kind of an open dialogue where all the lawyers and the court were kind of having an open dialogue and discussion with the jury there. And the court got sort of, you can understand, sort of uneasy, but, but no one preserved exactly what was said in the chambers conference later, even after the jury was sent out. And so it was sort of a, it was a difficult um, then situation to evaluate and look at, uh, okay, well, who preserved what? Uh, what is the prejudice? And so you have to really, even real time, when you're thinking about um, what this looks like real time, continue to preserve those objections. And if you are the one offering an objection, for example, that um, you know that the jury needs to be re-instructed and re-deliberate on something, you got to put that on the record. And even if you do it later, even if the jury has then been sent back, make sure that you preserve it. And again, take the time to say, Your Honor, I want to be sure that we have our chambers conference on the record. Um, again, this goes back to Melanie's, our rule number one, which is have a reporter for everything. Hopefully we're illustrating for you what that means in real life. You had a reporter there, but if something happened in chambers and the reporter doesn't take it down, it is as if it did not happen. The same is true for objections. Same is true for jury instructions. So Hopefully you're getting our theme here. Okay, uh, number 10. Okay, so another um, important uh, mistake is um, in California courts forgetting to request a statement of decision after a bench trial. Now, a statement of decision is a powerful tool, tool to require the trial court to explain its rulings. Oftentimes, it's the only way you can really challenge a trial court's factual findings um, because it, the court has to state the basis for its findings, and that way you could disclose possibly an abuse of discretion if the court relied on improper factors, if it didn't consider factors that it was required to consider, if it considered inadmissible evidence. That's the only way you can kind of dig be beneath that and find that out, or you can... Um, sometimes disclose legal error. And um, these are the statements of decision. Look at sections, CCP section 632 and 634 and the procedures at uh, rule of court 3.1590. Um, so the timing is important. You have to generally request um, uh, that this a statement of decision must be made within 10 days after the announcement or service of the tentative decision. Um, or if the court, if it's a really short trial, if the trial was completed within one day or less than eight hours, the request has to be made before the matter was submitted for decision. And then once the proposed statement is issued, you have 15 days to object to missing facts or unaddressed issues. And this is really, these objections are critical for appeal. Um, the fail, if you don't make objections, failure to raise um, objections or ambiguities in the statement of decision waives the right to assert these errors on appeal and the appellate court must assume the existence of any findings favorable to respondent in support of the judgment, the doctrine of implied findings. Um, on the other hand, and this is really important, a timely and sufficient objection to a proposed or missing um, factual finding means the court of appeal will not infer that the trial court found in favor of the prevailing party and will not infer that there are facts in the record to support that factual finding. And um, that's really, really important in terms of an appellate review. If the court has, to, if, the, if the, there's no objection made, the court will just infer without even examining the record that there is evidence to support it. But if there was an objection, the court can't do that and can't just infer that there must have been evidence. Um, now, your objection could prompt the trial court to cure the defect and make the statement of decision even stronger. That's, that's kind of a, a, a um, risk that you take. But on balance, I would say it's more important to make sure you very carefully object and um, object to the findings and any factual findings that are not in a statement of decision. And Melanie, yeah, I agree with that. And um, and while the court may end up, yes, strengthening a statement of decision, um, it's better than having, you know, you're forfeiting your right to challenge those issues or having the doctrine of implied findings um, essentially work against you. Right. And so um, and, and I would also note that if you don't request a statement of decision, 
you forfeit your right to, to doing it, but the court may prepare one anyway. But again, then you will have forfeited, again, your, your uh, opportunity to, to argue that issues were not identified in, in the statement of decision, right, Melanie? So there's multiple yeah. levels of forfeiture that can happen here or unfavorable standards of review. If you don't step through each of the elements, meet the timing requirements and um, either make a, your request that specifies the controverted issues that you want, uh, a statement of decision on or file file your objections once you have the proposed. So this is a really important one to just follow step by step. And um, on the other hand, if you are the winning party, you may not want to request a statement of decision. You know, it's better for you to have general findings and, and not to have the specific findings that could maybe disclose an abuse of discretion or not substantial evidence. Right. So there is strategic thought to, to go into this one. Um, and then in, I wanted to just um, put a little pin here. In federal court, there is also a process, federal rule of civil procedure 52, um, that entitles you to a statement of factual finding and legal conclusions. It's generally mandatory, um, but it can be amended by a timely motion. And so again, um, really understanding if you're in state court or if you're in federal court, what your procedures are uh, to get that when you have a, a, a bench trial, essentially. Um, and so check out uh, Rule 52 on the, on the federal side. All right. Mistake number 11. So this is in, in federal court again. Um, these are, these are a, about um, the, the kinds of motions that you intend potentially to make post-trial. Um, but again, the mistake here that we wanted to highlight is forgetting to make a Rule 50A uh, motion. So that's a motion for a judgment uh, as a matter of law. It's similar to a JNOV in state court, but in federal court, you have to make a Rule 50A motion before the issue is handed to the jury. That's when you would, would say to the court um, that you are challenging the sufficiency of the evidence and that you think you're entitled to a ruling as a matter of law on whatever issue would go to the jury. If you do not make that motion under Rule 50A, you cannot move for judgment as a matter of law after the jury has returned a verdict. You have waived the issue. Um, and so you really need to understand um, what that means, what the sufficiency of the evidence challenge is. And if you think that they may have failed on an element of proof of their case, um, then you really need to be thinking about your Rule 50A motion before the issue or before the, um, the claim for relief goes to the jury. Um, that's really my, uh, in summary about that. Melanie, anything to add? It's a unique procedure and it's a very common mistake and it's one of the first things I, um, when we get hired to come on for post-trial motions, one of the first things I look for is, um, was a Rule 50A motion made before it went to the jury if, if judgment as a matter of law is something that we might potentially want to argue? Okay, mistake number 12. And then we have at least a couple of questions that have already come into the Q&A. And so if you're, as we're wrapping up here, um, we will have time for a few questions, but if you want to put them in, um, please go ahead. So we're in our last slide. Um, so this one is um, forgetting altogether to, to think about post-trial motions. I mentioned earlier that it can be a good time to consult with appellate counsel in preparing post-trial motions to make sure issues are preserved for appeal. Um, but, but there may be either unpreserved issues, um, as Melanie noted with a statement of decision, you could end up wanting to shore things up. It could be the trial court's opportunity to shore up its decisions. Um, there may be some things that you have to litigate in post-trial motions like attorney's fees. Um, and so this may depend also on the kind of verdict form that you used in the court that you're in, whether state court or federal court. Um, but it may be necessary, as I said, um, to challenge an inconsistent verdict before the jury is uh, discharged. I really think that's something to think about um, in both state and federal court, but it's required in federal court. Um, these kinds of post-trial motions could include a judgment as a matter of law. Um, as I mentioned, in federal court, Rule 50. Um, in state court, it could be a JNOV, could be a new trial motion. And in state court, you should also be aware there are certain issues that you have to preserve in a motion for new trial or you've waived them. One of the issues is either excessive or inadequate damages. Um, you cannot raise that issue on appeal if you did not move for new trial on those grounds. Another one is um, juror misconduct. And so you need to, you need to raise that. Um, and there I've seen your, so let's say you, you then, um, you're not going to submit new evidence on appeal. So think about this. You learn later that there was juror misconduct. 
you can, at the time of filing a new trial motion, get declarations from other some of the jurors and, and, and identify what the misconduct issue was. You can't file those declarations for the first time on appeal. So you need to have preserved and made a robust record in the trial court, and that issue needs to be brought forward in a, in a new trial motion. I will say JNOV and new trial are slightly different in terms of the timing. With a new trial motion, you need to file the notice of your intent to file um, a motion for new trial. You need to identify the issues you intend to move on. Um, the timing, the timeline is short. And so you need to really pay attention to those um, if you intend to file a JNOV or a new trial motion. Um, and they also do impact the time to file your notice of appeal. And so it's important to understand um, the, the code procedures around the post-trial motions, how they interact, um, whether you want to file them before the court enters judgment, after the court enters judgment, and how that impacts your, your notice of appeal timing. Um, because as Melanie said, filing a notice of appeal is jurisdictional. So you want to, you need at the outset to understand uh, your time clock for filing a notice of appeal. Um, okay, so thank you again to the San Diego Law Library and to all of you for coming today. I think that's it from us. Feel free to reach out if you have any lingering questions when you review the materials. I know we move quickly today. Thanks for being here. We appreciate you.